Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Dan Borshi coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. Coming up, Dan Andrews quits. One of the country's most successful and most divisive leaders walks away. No campaigner Nungai Warren Mundine ramps up the rhetoric as voting begins in the voice referendum. And countdown to summer, how prepared are we for another ominous bushfire season? Joining me on the panel, former New South Wales Nationals MP Katrina Hodgkinson. Welcome back. Hi, great to be here. In Melbourne, marketing strategist Toby Ralph. Hey there. Hello. Comedian and philosopher Mitch Alexander, great to have you along. Hey, thanks for having me. And joining us shortly from Brisbane, Senior Research Fellow at Deakin University, John Davis. And you can join us online using the hashtag The Drum and we live stream on Facebook as well. Later in the program, we'll be joined by ABC journalist Ralph Epstein to talk about a momentous day in Victorian politics. But let's get some quick reactions from our resident Victorians, Mitch and Toby. Uh, Mitch, firstly, what have you made of it? Um, lots of gnashing, wailing of teeth. I've seen dozens of people out in the nature strip just tearing their clothes off, screaming <laughs> to the sky. It's, uh, it's harrowing scenes in Victoria. Toby? I'm sure you can imagine how upset I was. I do actually, I've never been a Dan fan, but I salute the fact that he's bailed before he's been booted. Very few politicians do that. Mm. Well, more on that later, but let's begin with the Voice to Parliament referendum. Tensions reignited today as one of the leaders of the No campaign delivered a fiery address to the National Press Club. Nungai Warren Mundine hit out at the, quote, lies he says are at the heart of the voice and at how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been painted during the campaign. He said most First Nations people are doing fine and must choose between continuing to feel aggrieved or, quote, to draw a line in history and move on. And he took aim at the Uluru Statement from the Heart, the founding document of The Voice, with this. Both the 439 words on the canvas and the 26-page manifesto that sets out their agenda. What we describe as a symbolic declaration of war against modern Australia. The canvas is a glossy marketing brochure for the misappropriation of culture, a misrepresentation of history, and for a radical and divisive vision of Australia. All done in the name of Indigenous Australians, but working against us. Professor Megan Davis, one of the architects of The Voice, said this in response. It's very disappointing that it's being regarded as some sort of aggressive and angry display um, um, or declaration of war upon modern Australia. Our people contributed to the development and the flourishing of a modern Australia. Um, our people's role in that is not always recognised or acknowledged, um, but we have and we are a part of modern Australia. And this process, this constitutional process, was a process set up by modern Australia in Australian democracy. The question put to us is what is meaningful recognition to you as First Nations peoples? And what our people said was we want to be recognised, recognition through a voice. And that was Cobble Cobble uh, woman and constitutional lawyer, Professor Megan Davis, whose brother John is with us on the panel tonight. We've fixed the gremlins in the system. Good to have you along. Gary, Gary, thanks for having us. John, tell me, what was your reaction to that speech at the press club today? Oh, non-reaction. You know, as in this, this whole notion of creating um, hysteria is something which is a, a gift of our people. Like, it's, um, that's why I'm looking forward to the referendum, because... Um, I'm here in the Brisbane studio and to have 20,000 yes marches uh, just a week, a weekend ago, uh, absolutely uplifting and hope springs eternal like, as compared to the um, litany of uh, other kind of media responses. But uh, in relation to, uh, to Mundine, I mean, I would love for him then to show and to the other no campaigners to show where's their sense, collective sense making process. What can they say where they're bringing these ideas of declaration of war? Wow. It's a, it's a really disappointing uh, and fract fractious way of um, commenting on a process which is connected to those old patterns of yarning in circle. Mm. Uh, yeah, and you mentioned about those uh, marches. I think that there were about 250,000 people, uh, some estimates, marching across the country. I want to take you to that particular comment that you just alluded to there, the claim that uh, Warren Mundine made that, quote, the Uluru Statement is a symbolic declaration of war against modern Australia. 
How did you react to that? Oh, Dan, like for our people, you, this notion of feeling you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So the notion of setting circles, creating a conversation and, and having our voice at the forefront is somehow um, jarring for a majority of uh, non-Indigenous Australians, uh, jarring for us as a, as a political uh, nation. It's, it's it, it, they're, they're, they're mistruths, they're lies. Like the, what we saw too, just on the weekend, and it was blessed to have uh, my sister there, but also our family, like in our local community, very small, but beautiful community though too, in Bean Lee Logan, south of Logan, walking across the Red Bridge is iconically known, uh, full yes, and majority non-Indigenous. It's great to see the other 97% standing up and, and walking with and leading with us, because that's the, that's the challenge, is having the other 97% and with the referendum, come in, vote yes. Um, that's, that's the great proposition we've got forward is in this democratic country is to have that notion of saying yes uh, in moving forward. And Katrina, that statement, a symbolic declaration of war against modern Australia, is that how you feel about the Uluru Statement? No, I don't. I don't at all. In fact, I, that was the one part of Warren's speech that I, I didn't like. Um, but I thought that he said a lot of really good things as well. And, you know, he laid out those four pillars and I've heard him speak about that. And I've also heard Jacinta speak about that before as well. Both incredibly fine Australians, um, Indigenous Australians, with an alternative viewpoint, you know. So um, some of the things, the great things that Warren said today um, were in relation to children getting appropriate levels of education. He said that if, um, you know, children receive the education, um, um, you know, that, that, you know, if Indigenous children receive the same education as, as others in the community, um, that, you know, and the they, they might otherwise... The voice. That might that might other, excuse One me, person speaking. That, that might otherwise not have received that excellent education. You know, if they can receive that, then they've got education every opportunity has to... Has groups to speak that for they've people. got every, <laughs> every opportunity to person. also achieve. We're just trying to let like Katrina so, finish. Um, also, he mentioned economic participation, you know, opportunities in the workforce, which is really important for your, uh, for your mental health and for your self-esteem. So I thought that they were terrific things that he, that he said. And also he called out Corporate Australia and said if they really want to help, then perhaps they can be, be helping with funding more educational facilities. So I think that that was, you know, re some really positive things that he said today. I thought it was an excellent speech. I thought there were some unfortunate points. I thought his comments on the Uluru Statement were unfortunate. I didn't agree with them. But, um, you know, what also... What do you think the point of those, those comments were then? Because that, that statement is... Well, I mean, Megan Davis said that it was infl inflammatory. inflammatory. Well, that Warren's comments? Yeah. yeah. Well, look, I think that, you know, respect for both sides is really paramount with this debate. Um, I, I am, I'm voting no, and I'm almost afraid sometimes to tell people that I am voting no because of the hostility that then comes back to me um, about my viewpoint. But, you know, there's already $4.3 billion being spent um, on Indigenous agencies, and I think that they should be audited first and let's see what they're doing wrong. Why isn't it, ha why isn't it working in some areas? So let's, let's do that work first. Um, that's taxpayer money that's going into that. Non -indigenous so majority let's, make, let's make sure that that's working the right way in the first place. And also, um, you know, I think that people have got to respect the views of everybody in this debate. Mm. And... I'm all for having a debate, but let's keep it respectful. Let's keep it um, how, how we feel, truly, and let's not be afraid to say how we feel. John, did you want to respond there? Oh, definitely. Again, I'd like to... I, I, hear, I hear the points that you're talking about individuals around Mundine and just enterprise. What I'm asking for, colleagues, is where is the collective no conversation? Because that is what the invitation... If we said we're we, you, you took offence to the Uluru Statement, that was what... Uh, of those comments from Mundine. That was what the Uluru Statement represents, dialogues of our people. The No campaign's built up around this notion of individuals I, who aren't I talking totally from a collective that, response. John, but also where's I think the, that all I'm Marbo asking for you respectfully and collectively so is where's that collective so no response? response? That's, that's all I'm asking. It's not. You don't have it. There's no, it's not there. And the reality is around the Uluru Statement, eight, over 80% of our people, Indigenous people, agree with the notion of having the Uluru Statement with hard the voice enshrine the Constitution. You said you're voting. No, I'm voting yes. I'm, I'm, I employ all our, all our colleagues and all our friends and families to do the same because it's about an opportunity for our people. It's about an opportunity for our people. I just think that since Marbo, since WIC, we've all been working towards reconciliation. I think we've, we've just gained leaps and strides over the past 20 or 30 years in that space. 
Um, I think we're making great progress. The money was never put forward. in after Mabo. That's the thing. That's the challenge. Well, we've it's never had 4. a voice to be able to, we've going never into had a chance moment. to be able to challenge that in so, relation to where the funding's gone. And the yeah, coalition yeah, so government for many years. Let's order it. Let's see where that, it's going. I've had that lever. I think that that's really important. I've just said that. I Mr. Scully really and Co. creating a, a process let's, called NIAA. Let's audit. It should have actually been called um, NA or, 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 or NFA or NFI because the reality is these structures get created by non-Indigenous and that's the challenge and that's why we want a voice to be able to have our own say from our own local communities. I come from a community control organisation in Logan Central and that's what we've been talking about is being able to have a voice from Logan Central to Canberra, not via Megan Davis, not via Mundine, but actually from our people and that's what the opportunity represents. Look, I, I totally respect your point of view. I just see a lot of money going into the system at the moment. I don't know where it's going. I'm a taxpayer as well as you know, don't the you? rest have, of Australia. Have, weren't you a part of your um, estimates and getting those, that, getting those information? I'm sorry, I retired from Parliament six years ago. Well, um, th but, the money's been spent. But, that's the thing. That, that's the reality. It doesn't get spent on our people. It's, well, it's, it's in the budget. It's there in the budget. And it, it's, that's where it's supposed to be oh, going. Wait up. Maybe you should reply so, to the, uh, uh, the big four that we've had auditing our books for the last whatever years, because that's also been a part of the, de the demographic, hasn't it? All the way that we go about... Um, um, auditing our, our particular processes. Look, like, I can understand like, yeah, let's, you let's attacking me because I'm voting no, and I understand racism. how other people right. also just, feel just, voting just, no just, because we're just trying to express what we were actually going to be doing. And this and is it's, it's why it's a lot of people are actually group, afraid to say how they're voting because they then Please get attacked for it. So I'm, I'm not afraid. Come I'm here. Come to our communities and have yarns with us. So more than Mundine. There's the opportunity. You want to come for a bigger yarn? I have. More than I've had many conversations, and I will continue to have many conversations. And I totally respect your viewpoint. Mitch, I want to bring. I want to bring. I want to bring you in, Mitch, because Warren Mundine also said that for real reconciliation, Indigenous people also need to forgive Australia as a nation. What does that mean to you? I reckon John should answer that one. It's not something for me to really speak to. I think part of this whole problem, again, is that we are letting uh, bad faith actors and people with vested interests uh, have the ground and bring up things that are irrelevant to what we're, what we're talking about. Um, this whole thing about it, it's, it's a voice uh, to Parliament um, from First Nations people. So I would Thanks, rather Mitch. they speak on it. Well, John, what did, what did, you, did you make of that comment? Come and do's Mitch, and Mitch is a great example of the way we can create more space for our First Nation voices to come through. Um, Dan, sorry, I was um, I was listening to Mitch when he was um, when, he, when he was responding. So if you, if you can uh, ask the question again, I'm happy to respond. Yeah, yeah. So it was that that quote um, that that Warren Mundine had said that for quote for real reconciliation, Indigenous people also need to forgive Australia as a nation. What does that mean to you? Again, about our people. <laughs> Reconciliation, it's been a part of our landscape since I heard a colleague talk about Mabo, since Mabo. And um, there's a really clear reconciliation uh, agenda through, our, through a whole range of our different institutions, like in education, uh, an actual reconciliation Australia, which provides... You know, that's, uh, that, that's the challenge, Dan, for us, as you know, as our people, that have been coming up to the plate and offering and, and forgive. That's, it's been a part of it. It's, I've never been a part of any of our communities, and I've worked all around Australia. I've never seen our communities not uh, create a space, a safe space of humility and openness to say, let's move forward. What I have seen, because you can definitely follow me and also invite colleagues as well and you come down to Logan Central, I can still get on a train and no one sits next to me and like I'm here in a jacket and, but it's, a, it's a, that is the examples of feelings of our people and they're the things that are reflected, the racist attitudes, whether you like it or not, that's what Reconciliation Australia helps provide through the barometer check. There's ways our people feel where we don't feel safe and in, in feeling that safety, there's ways that we could get forward where we actually create more space, which is what a voice, safe space, which is what a voice potentially represents. So the notion of feeling pain and hurt, I mean, come on. That's, they're, they're, these are pieces we've, we've, we've threaded, we've woven for. It's, it almost sounds like a harking back to the, the black armband history days. I mean, that's why we marched on these bridges in the first place behind me back in the 2000s when the Howard era was starting to create the mantra of not saying sorry and not apologising, not recognised. I, I find it quite... Not hilarious, but it's an interesting point that colleagues from uh, other parties uh, single or mention about uh, Mabo type decisions, and that was and has been one of the most strongest struggles to get to that notion of equity, and still hasn't created equity. My mob, our Cobble mob, we're still fighting for for native title after having cases from 1997. That's what Mar that's the opportunity of the Mabo was meant to represent. That's too long. That's why we want a voice to be able to say for our mob and put our ideas out forward that, hey, let's create this better equity, this safe space, and actually enact these legislations and these laws that are actually there and be able to have that voice, be able to say, you know what, it actually isn't working. It hasn't happened in our different spaces. So we'd like to do that. We'd like to be 
uh, more active and proactive in our communities. Uh, Toby, I want to bring you in because today Professor Megan Davis told the ABC that, quote, this is pretty baseline Trumpian misinformation uh, that she was pointing to that speech by Warren Mundine uh, and saying that it, it's, it tips over the line of unacceptable political communication. Mm. Clearly, Professor Davis saying that this, this is not the way to be having this conversation. What did you make of it? Uh, well, I should, I should preface it by saying I've done now three large formal research studies into the efficacy of the yes and no campaigns in The Voice. And um, the bottom line of that, ignoring Warren's speech for a moment, the bottom line of that is that both campaigns have been woeful. Both campaigns have been costing their own side votes, um, probably because the yes campaign has had a, a, a larger voice if you like, a larger budget, that's done more damage to its case than the no case has to it. So it's been a very disappointing, um, it's been a very disappointing uh, hyperbolic campaign and uh, Australians are upset that it's, that it's been an argument, not a discussion. Yeah. Uh, mm. You know, the, the, what, what people want in a referendum is for someone to say, here's an idea, now let's fund a group to say why it's a good idea and fund another group to say why it's a bad idea. Let's discuss it and let's collectively agree on it. And that hasn't happened in this, in this case. There were, there were a couple of really serious strategic errors up front, if I'm not talking too much. The first strategic error was that government decided they'd make it a sales pitch, not a discussion. And they, mm. they, they said we won't we're not going to release the details because they you know, they might get picked on and and th thus the campaign might get picked apart and people in my research group were saying well hang on if they if if they won't show us the details shouldn't they fix the details rather than hide them and that created a whole lot of uncertainty there were a whole lot of a whole lot of missteps all the way through the campaign on both sides and it's been a very ugly debate and the it's it's one. disappointing yeah. non bipartisan support Great. that's been the most Great. disappointing because when our mm. colleagues from the other side don't just say, let's take the politics out of it and, and say we agree on these pieces. I mean, yeah. that's, I, I, love what, I love what Adam Briggs said the mm -hmm. other day, and they're, they're holding a, a Yes concert, Adam Briggs and Paul Kelly, uh, on, on, on this weekend, and he said really clearly, the no, if, we, if there's a vote for no, that's business as usual. I'm going to go to work, I'm going to look after, I'm going to provide my family and communities, and yes, yes is a whole new opportunity, something we haven't seen in this country, and correcting some of those mistruths and there's misnomers about where we come and who we are. So it's a whole different reality. And that's the, that's the part, that's the pivot I'm, I'm really keen and excited. I'm, just, I'm very disappointed at, at our space where our um, other sides of politics haven't decided to put down the, um, the fighting clubs and the spears and, and not come together in relation to that. Uh, really hopeful of yes. Well, we'll certainly be talking more about this in, in the couple of weeks ahead before the referendum. Uh, moving on now, the first uh, National Bushfire Preparedness Summit has kicked off with more than 200 organisations coming together to war game mock disaster scenarios. All signs point to a summer as hot and as dry as we've seen for a number of years, fuelled by an El Nino system declared by the Weather Bureau last week. The two-day summit with governments, emergency services, charities, banks and telcos is the first time all stakeholders have gathered to coordinate responses. Emergency Management Minister Murray Watt says we're better prepared this season than we were before the deadly black summer of four years ago. We've established the Disaster Ready Fund, which will invest $1 billion in disaster mitigation over the next five years. We've doubled the funding for aerial firefighting and will this year have over 500 firefighting aircraft available, more than Australia has ever had before. We're building the first ever national emergency stockpile to supplement jurisdictions' own resources of emergency housing, water for purification equipment and other necessities for when disasters strike. Greg Mullins is the former New South Wales Fire and Rescue Commissioner and is a councillor with the Climate Council. He joins us now from Sydney where uh, it's good to have you along and it looks like you've got uh, an unusual setting on your uh, camera. We're going we're to stick with you, though, Craig. Uh, tell me, how prepared are we if there's the kind of fire season that some are forecasting? Well, unfortunately, when we are looking at a serious fire season, um, that's always the case after a triple La Nina event. Um, not in 57, 77, 01, 02, we had serious bushfires on the east coast immediately following a triple La Nina. Um, already we've seen 
emergency warnings in Western Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, uh, Northern Territory, and even Tasmania, which is really worrying. And of course, announcement of an El Nino and a positive Indian Ocean dipole, which makes it drier and hotter. So we're almost certainly going to have a busy year, but hopefully not as bad as black summer. Mm. Right now, Greg, what are the highest priority areas that still need to be addressed in terms of our national bushfire preparedness? Well, just listening to the Minister, <clears throat> I was in back in 2019 trying to warn the Morrison government with 22 other former fire chiefs from every fire service in Australia about the looming black summer. Um, so things have changed markedly. You've got a government that actually listens, a government you don't have to argue with about the science of climate change, and they are doing a lot. But I have to say it's very strange to have a government that's up the targets for emissions reduction, yet still um, approves more coal, oil and gas exploration and mines. And um, that's what's heating the planet. That's what's leading to extreme weather. That's why we're getting these massive fires like we've seen in Greece, Canada, Maui, um, our black summer fires, the floods in Libya, um, China, Pakistan. They all have the fingerprints of climate change on them. So we have to get serious about climate action as well as investing in hardening our infrastructure, developing community resilience programs, getting ahead of the game, not waiting for fire services to respond and hopefully try to put things out on the worst days. We have to make communities much safer. Mm. Uh, Katrina, this meeting where all the fire authorities and all of those other support groups <coughs> that I mentioned a moment ago came together, how important is it for that to be happening and getting in the same room and talking about different scenarios and ways to navigate this? Yeah, look, I think it's really commendable. I think it's a great time of the year to be doing it as well. It's still September, so we know that we've got a, a big summer coming up. Um, I know there's been some, some cool burns in recent weeks around you know, the various areas, which is great. My biggest concern and my biggest worry is, yes, climate change is important, very significant, but this summer, what are the practical outcomes going to be? So I really hope that National Parks is very much in the room and is also doing their controlled burns at this time of the year because, I'll tell you what, I lived through those um, bushfires from, that started in the Namadji National Park mm. back in the you know, early early days of January uh, 2003 and then swept right around Burrinjuk Dam and, and back into Canberra and took out 400 homes and, and we tragically lost four lives as well. Came within very close proximity to my own property and it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. But the fuel had been allowed to build up so much in the national parks that it just literally went off like a bomb and just spread so quickly, you know, 17 lightning strikes and away it went. Mm. Um, so I'm really hoping that national parks have done their homework in this space. I was talking to Steph Cook this morning, she's um, the former Emergency Services Minister in New South Wales. She's now the member for Cootamundra, which was my seat. And she was saying that she's been trying for six years to get a cultural burn happening in the Weddon National Park, which is in the central west of New South Wales, has been unable to get national parks to comply, to even, you know, to get there. So that is my biggest concern. I think Greg's been doing an amazing mm. job. Greg Mullen's been doing an amazing job. You know, hats off to the RFS. They're really trying hard. I just really, I'm, I'm very concerned about national parks in New South Wales. Yeah, on that point, Greg, uh, are we behind when it comes to those uh, backburns or cool burns in particularly in national parks? Or hazard reduction burns? Um, yes, however, everybody's behind because mm. frankly, it's just been too we wet to burn. Years, yeah. We've, yeah, we've had three years of record rainfall. Um, I've retired from fire and rescue. I'm back where I started as a teenager as a volunteer firefighter with the RFS now and fought fires throughout New South Wales in black summer. Um, but we've been trying to organise burns locally. So first it was too wet to burn. And then a couple of weeks ago when we had burns scheduled, uh, we got extreme and catastrophic fire weather. And so it was too dangerous to burn. Yeah. And this is, we're being squeezed every year now. The windows to burn are just smaller and smaller. And that's because of the changing climate. Um, and the other, the other issue, look, national parks are doing a lot of burning and I, happen, I happen to know that they're doing a lot in the cultural burning space. Um, I've recently been appointed to the National Parks Advisory Council and asked these specific questions. So they're working with in Indigenous 
cultural owners um, facilitating these burns. Um, but it is very difficult to get them scheduled all across the state. Perhaps you can get them onto weather. So much work. Mm. Uh, yeah, John, do you feel like we've learnt the lessons from those devastating bushfires across 2019 and 2020, the start of 2020? And, and what did we learn about that, about listening to elders on, on some of that country? There's a few elements I agree with uh, colleagues on online here, especially on the Indigenous Knowledge System piece, mm. and that's, you know, the, the, the cool burns are an essential element of the way we keep that uh, that fuel in in check and big shout out to the Fire Sticks Alliance, uh, Victor Stephenson and the crew. They've they've, they've trained out our, our mods. We have our Bunya Murray Ranges uh, headed up by Shannon Bounds, Trish and Lona, uh, up on Bunya Bunya, and, and you know they're trained up in that in that cool burn uh, technology piece. And I guess it's something too. I think I heard Catherine say. Is the other other flag on that then is they haven't been expanded enough then. So there's this potential of having these these great uh, energies and resources and and and, when, and th there's an opportunity to expand that and, and build that out and ripple that further because we noticed back on country just recently um, south of Bunyas that Tara the fires were up and a few of our uh, TO mobs are looking to head back just around the notion of then impacts of old ancient scar trees that get burnt you know there's, there's a massive impact um, and, and sorry to hear about the, the, you know, the, the other, there's the other fatality piece which uh, communities uh, have to in a most shocking mm -hmm. sense deal with and then the then there's the cultural heritage piece and the oldest living surviving culture has has elements of our um, signaling trees um, uh, at threat mm. when we when we don't move and and move on good patterns because the the the, the uh, cool burns fire six alliance uh, the patterns of our like and just out, shout out from our um, Bunya Ranger area it's 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 been a really amazing piece and and then working with the rural fire brigade and and such it's it's shown a great reconciliation piece with you know those, those pieces that we work walking and working together. Mm. Hey Toby, is there a an argument here for more rolling awareness campaigns and discussions about how everyone needs to get involved and have plans or be part of these solutions? Probably, I, I would think so. I'm, I, I know very little about this. I've got a very urban life, and I, I, you've got experts on the panel who know more about that. But yeah, I would think you'd, it would be helpful to increase awareness. It's very good to see everyone getting in the room together because we'll get some concrete plans. You know, I always think that leadership isn't about coming up with great strategies. You know, that's a lower level skill. Leadership is about getting a diverse range of stakeholders together and getting them all to take a step in the same direction at the same time. Mm. It sounds like that's what's happening and that's, that's impressive and, and reassuring. Yeah. Hey, Mitch, Melburnians lived through Black Saturday in 2009 where there was that devastating 173 deaths in that extreme weather event. How do you think that changed how people there talk and think about the threat of fire? It's every every disaster updates the the sort of language. I'm just not sure if it's sort of you know starting to cut through enough. I was really happy to hear Greg mention climate change because that is the the pressing issue about this. Um, I grew up uh, around Lismore and Mullumbimby, and so we've had bushfires you know in Victoria and New South Wales, but we also have had the massive flooding and everything that's happening there and we need to be really hammering the fact that climate change means that we cannot prepare for these types of disasters unless we account for climate change or to put it another way there's no point trying to prepare for these disasters because the years are going to get worse and worse so while we have a government that is still renewing fossil fuel projects all across the country we can't properly prepare as a nation to survive these disasters to support each other during these disasters Hey, Greg, to, to round us out, what are the immediate priorities that need to be taken place in terms of preparedness? And you talked about being a volunteer. How much does that fit into the frame about volunteering and, and getting more people in? Well, the demographics of volunteers is getting older and older. So I'm in my 60s and I, I'm pretty fit, but uh, often I'm the youngest person on the truck. So we really need young people to step forward and become volunteers. Um, we need all of the agencies, national parks, forestry, the urban fire and rescue services to work together. This summit is a really good idea. It's the first one. Um, New Year's Eve in Batemans Bay, where I was fighting mm. fires, that was just mm. disastrous. Terrible. But the power went, Terrible. so we lost refrigeration, we lost sewerage, we lost, lost running water. Um, everything went. And these are the lifelines. So reaching out to the private sector, to the NGOs who come in for early relief, really good idea look um and back to that those comments about climate change really good climate uh really good comments we need to think about 
future summers because the science is saying by 2040, black summer will be a normal summer, the hottest, driest year ever. Um, the, our environmental legislation is being reviewed and it's got no climate triggers. So we need to think of the future. Think of the here and now, of course, and the governments have invested a lot, are doing really well. But we need to think of about my kids and my grandkids and everybody's grandkids. Yeah, absolutely. Greg Mullins is the former New South Wales Fire and Rescue Commissioner. Thanks for your company tonight. Thank you. After nine years as Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews caught many off guard today when he called a snap news conference to announce he'll leave the job tomorrow afternoon. He was first elected to the Victorian Parliament in 2002, became leader of the state Labor Party in 2010 and was elected Premier in 2014. Following last year's state election, Mr Andrews has repeatedly said he would serve his full term. But he told reporters earlier today thoughts of what he would do next in his career had begun creeping in. This is such a great honour and privilege. It's such a, a, a profound thing. You never want to finish up in a situation where you aren't enjoying the work and where you are resentful of the fact that you're doing this and not doing something else. I'm not at that point, but I'm determined never to get to that point. And having made this decision today, not an easy decision, uh, but a really important one, uh, I won't get to that point. I am worse than a work workaholic. I'd spend every waking moment is about the work and there's only so long you can do that for. So I'm looking forward to a very different place and doing different different things and part of this is I don't know what I'll finish up doing. He told Prime Minister Anthony Albanese of his decision to resign this morning. This was the PM's response. Daniel's career has been quite extraordinary. He has had uh, a, a lot uh, thrown at him over the years. He stood up for his values at all times. And I wish him and Kath and the family all the very best. I can confirm that he did cook that barbecue that day in his backyard, uh, in spite of uh, an example of the sort of crazy stuff sometimes that's thrown at people in public life. Uh, Daniel Andrews. Uh, has throughout it all uh, continued to, to front up, continued to represent the interests of Victorians. Victoria's opposition leader John Pizzuto says the state has been left worse off under Andrew's leadership. After nine years in office, are we better off under Daniel Andrews? It takes longer to wait for a hospital bed. It takes longer to wait for an ambulance. It costs more than anywhere else in the country to send your kid to a government school in Victoria and in many cases academic standards in our schools have stagnated. Our child protection system is in crisis sadly. Our roads are being terribly neglected. Daniel Andrews has made his announcement today because frankly and regrettably the truth caught up with him. You can only make false promises and get away with it for so long. Sooner or later eventually the truth catches up with you. Raf Epstein is a long-time Victorian journalist and hosts Mornings on ABC Melbourne and joins us now. Welcome to the program, Raf. Good to have you along. Hi there. Look, it seemed to catch many by surprise. What was your reaction and what's been the reaction this afternoon? Oh, I think it's universally surprise. Uh, a lot of Labor people have said to me, it's completely surprising but not surprising at all. Many people, in fact, I think even those who voted for him last November, did not expect him to um, stay the full term, so that would be another three years. But there is no doubt it is a surprise. There is also no doubt that it is 100% Dan Andrews, an incredibly tight control of information. Very few people knew. I was speaking to people, his own MPs and some of his ministers, they didn't know. They had no idea this was going to happen. That's the way Dan Andrews has run his government. And just one thing to keep in mind, I'm sure we'll get into a bit of this, but he broke his back. Uh, he put up with those sort of conspiracy theories that the PM was talking about. He did all the COVID lockdowns to brought attention to Victoria from around the world. He increased his majority last November. And if John Pizzuto thinks a speech like that's going to make a difference against his successor, I think the Liberals still don't understand the person who's beaten them at the last three elections. The question is if his successor can be as good. You just flogged my next question with uh, that list, Raf. So tell me, uh, what are your observations of his time as Premier? 
Most progressive Premier since Don Dunstan and the most divisive Premier since Jeff Kennett. I think if you're outside of Victoria, that's an easy way to understand it. If you come to Victoria, you'll see the road and rail projects. You'll see the new hospitals. They are, you know, like, that's a huge part of his success. He's transformed, I think, the notion of what debt means. But with all these level crossing removals, if you don't even understand what that is, just picture a tonne of suburban high streets across middle-class Melbourne, transformed by the fact there's no traffic there anymore and there's a nice park at the end of the street. So when people criticise Dan Andrews, say the Labor Party's bad with money, people go, well, hang on, there's something really nice down the end of my street that's revitalised my neighbourhood. So there is that. There's the really significant moves to try to fix domestic violence and mental health. He had a Royal Commission into both. Most progressive because we were the first state to bring in voluntary assisted dying. But I mean it when I say most divisive. Uh, I think everybody around the country saw what happened during the lockdowns. He did that very successfully. Um, he's probably the best politician in the country when it comes to completely dominating a press conference and completely exhausting um, some apoplectic journalists. But the, leg <laughs> the legacy is mixed, and you can't talk about Dan Andrews without talking about integrity, but I'm sure we'll get on to that. Mm. Uh, Mitch, how did you react to this news today? Uh, like I said earlier, I broke down. No, it's. I think it's really important to keep like a you know a clear-eyed view on this whole thing. I feel like it's very easy to sort of you know uh, deify or start myth-making pretty quickly about you know the type of you know, premier he was, but it's also you, people can be quick to sort of point out dictator Dan and the conspiracy theories and stuff. But um, I feel like. Uh, there's there's a, there's a little tidbit that I love about uh, his government because I'm not concerned about him as a person. I'm concerned about him as a premier and what we can learn from his time as premier for the next person to come along because they're, they're politicians. But one of my favourite things that I have found out only this year was that Visit Victoria, the, the tourism company, um, isn't subject to Freedom of Information Act requests because it's a company whose sole shareholder is Dan Andrews until tomorrow. It's the Premier of Victoria. And no one people know that. It's not very open. And so uh, Raf mentioned, you know, integrity and stuff like that. There were some really, really massive problems with the you'd call it like the Dan Andrews government, the things that they did that didn't stick to him, expanding police powers, uh, tearing down the Jabberong birthing trees, the tower lockdowns, which were found breached human rights, all that sort of stuff didn't stick to Dan. And so even though I am cognizant of all of those things, when I first heard the news today, I went, oh, that was that guy from all those press conferences. He, he, he felt stable. Um, and so when I say clear-eyed, I think it's important to remember that as a politician, he sort of has, you know, he's got a lot of roles, but two of the main ones that impact us are the legislation and the regulations and all the sort of laws that he passes. But then also his role is to just talk well, is to appear comforting in, in times of crisis. And he definitely did that very well, but I don't ever want that for any politician to overshadow the fact that they do things that impact people's lives sometimes very drastically. And we need to make sure that we hold politicians to account, even if they've done a good job, even if they've been um, positive in, in your own sort of you know, political sphere or in your group. Mm. Raf, Mitch mentioned there about some of those things that just didn't stick. You've talked about today how the support for, for Dan Andrews and the party just kept growing. Why didn't that stuff stick? Because he's brilliant with words. Uh, no one can reframe a debate and come up with a phrase and make the outrageous seem sensible the way Dan Andrews can. <laughs> uh, I understand all of those concerns that have just been mentioned. I've spoken about all of them uh, on my radio shows over, over the years. But his ability to wield words as a weapon. Uh, I did mention this earlier on ABC TV on the news channel, but when he says something like he's not a leader, he's just a liberal, in the middle of the lockdowns, in the middle of people like the former treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, criticising his approach to lockdowns. When he says on election night, in you know, three or four words, hope always defeats hate and sums up everything that's been said about him. All the crazy conspiracy theories linked to his back injury. It doesn't stick to him because his enemies, and he has enemies in the media, he has significant enemies in the media, and his political enemies, they fundamentally fail to understand him. The Labor Party railed against John Howard and could not believe that he could get away with things like children overboard and, and weapons of mass destruction and were outraged when John Howard began 
his 2004 election campaign with the words, this election is all about who you can trust. But no one can read the political mood like Dan Andrews and no one can wield words in quite the same way as Dan Andrews. Mitch is entirely right to bring up significant issues with something as fundamental as freedom of information. Victoria was at the forefront of those issues in the 1980s. We are not. We are laggards when it comes to those issues. There's a lot you can criticise Dan Andrews for when it comes to the centralisation of power in his office, but he's brilliant with words. Words leads to electoral success and electoral success leads to power and you get stuff done. And that's Dan Andrews. Love him or hate him. Katrina, I want to bring you in. You've been on the other side. Of, well, you are on the other side of politics. How did you uh, react to Dan Andrews' news today? I was just fascinated to listen to Raf then and, and the, the glory that he, he holds Dan Andrews in because I'm over the border. I'm in New South Wales, so I, I'm not living Dan Andrews like our Victorian friends are here on the panel. So when I think of Dan Andrews, I think of the Commonwealth Games cancellation. I think of the Melbourne Airport Rail Link cancellation. Um, you know, it seems to me that if nowadays, if, if, if you have a bad idea, people ask if you've been on the phone to Dan Andrews. You know, so he wasn't held in great esteem uh, in my neck of the woods. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to know him. Um, I haven't worked with him closely. But, um, you know, I think that to me, you know, I hope this doesn't sound like conspiracy, but it just seemed to me like he was getting on the nose. And so the hierarchy in the Labor Party have said, on, off you go, OK, you've, you've done a year, we've got three years until the next election, let's get somebody shiny and new in, let's get them, uh, let's get the constitu constituency used to a new Premier so that when we're facing the next election three years hence, they've got a much better chance of, of getting through and another four years of, of a Labor government. That's, that's how it looked to me. Raf, do you reckon there's any, any truth in that? Because you talked about... Dan no, Andrews I think Holt. that's fact-free, wishful thinking. It was and wishful I think thinking, it's that sort of, uh, I think it's <laughs> Total that thinking. sort of thinking that has meant... That's why the Liberal Party underestimated him. His poll numbers are great. He is completely in charge of the situation. They, people need to... And I mean this by journalists who, who want to scrutinise him, like me. And I mean this by the opposition who should be scrutinising him. And that is their job. And I wish them all the best with that. They need to understand who he is and what his success is and not sort of go, oh, they've, they've asked him, they've, they've sort of pushed him aside, they've shunted him aside. No. Dan Andrews runs this government. That is true. He has chosen the moment of his departure. He has chosen the moment of his departure when his poll numbers are fantastic. The opposition haven't shifted the dial from the last election for as, as much of those polls are worth. But, Raph, don't you think it's a stroke of genius that they've now got three years to train somebody up and get them through the next election? I do, but that's not because he's on the nose. Uh, I don't think that is the reason. The reason is Dan Andrews has chosen his successor. Jacinta Allen will almost certainly be that successor. Uh, I'm sure you can appreciate the irony. She was going to be the Commonwealth yeah, Games Minister. Right. Um, <laughs> but I do, I do think there's a fundamental problem. All of the things John Pazuda listed in his press conference today about the things that Dan Andrews had done wrong. Matthew Guy said them at two elections. They were the same issues. Integrity was always an issue for Dan Andrews. FOI has always been an issue. Spending a lot of money on construction projects has always been an issue. His mm. opponents mm. need to understand him. They completely fail to give him credit. This isn't about glorifying someone. This is about understanding the secrets to his success. Kevin Rudd got it with John Howard. That's one of the reasons he defeated him, not the mm. only reason. But people need to appreciate what he's good at before they critique him. Otherwise, I think the critique misses something crucial. He's increased his parliamentary majority every election. Every election. When, when people accuse Victorians of some sort of Stockholm syndrome, I just think people are failing to intellectually engage with what's actually happened in Victoria. And Toby, the Prime Minister today, praised Dan Andrews, saying his leadership was tested by some of the toughest times, particularly COVID-19. Anthony Albanese went on to say Dan Andrews never shirked the hard decisions. How did you react to all of this as it's unfolded today? With some pleasure, I have to say. Um, the, the, um, <laughs> I've never been a fan of Dan, but that's by the by. I agree with Raph that he's a consummate politician. You know, I think, I think political lives follow a fairly predictable arc. 
You know, you, you claw your way up to be Premier or Prime Minister or whatever it is, and, and, your, and your best day is your first day in there, really, you know, because more people like you than dislike you, and they're relieved that you replaced the last person. Then you go on and you, and you just start to upset a few people here and there, and, you're, and, you, and, you're, and your career and your popularity begins to wane. I mean, Raph was saying his numbers have never been better. In fact, they, they have been. His, his, his net disapproval rating is, is it, it, more people disapprove of him than approve of him, although the opposition um, have a lower have a higher disapproval rating, so there's a problem there. Um, but it's it, very, very few politicians, not even John Howard, get out before they're booted out. And Dan Andrews has acted astutely um, to, to bail before that is likely to happen, although whether it will happen with the opposition as they currently stand is, is questionable. Um, I, my, I, I have real concerns about some of the stuff he's done, some of the integrity issues, the east-west billion dollar waste, the, the, the cancellation of the Commonwealth Government, which I think undermines the credit of it. Commonwealth <laughs> Games, sorry. No, whoops. Hopefully. <laughs> the, 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 you know, the, which I think undermines trust in the state government uh, in, uh, and, and in Victoria in investments. And so that stuff worries me. Um, and there are a range of other things. But... He's, he's gone now, so good luck, enjoy your next job and, and um, uh, we'll see what your centre does. John, how are you reading this from the other side of the country where you are in Queensland? Oh, I just con concur with colleagues. I was going to say there's a, there's a care factor there too, like wellness. Like it, 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 you're in a space of time where you're able to call out the fact that, you know, enough's enough. I think I heard on the playback there about... Uh, then Andrew singing out about you know I, I put in 110 percent in when I'm when I'm doing these roles. It's it's a there's an important wellness factor that um a, a, and caring factor around having that chance just to get back to your basics, your family, the, the ones who sustain you. So in, in that regard, it's a it's a it's a great thing. I mean, all of us were a part of when it came to the COVID the way our um our different states reacted and and, and rolled on a whole range of different um, lockdown processes and procedures in relation to that. Um, you know, it was very clear from a Melbourne uh, perspective what was happening and how it was happening. And um, yeah, I, I, if anything, Dan, I would sing out the um, uh, with Dan Andrews the fact that it's, uh, there's a there's a wellness component there as well, and definitely recognise anyone in, in politics when you're wanting to go down a gear or or focus back on your your inner circle. That's a that's a good thing. We probably need to see more of it too uh, in politics. It's such a pressure cooker. Uh, yeah, scenario. True. Yeah, well, K Katrina, it's it's not often that as politicians you get to decide when you leave. There must be something in that as well, isn't there? Oh, look, getting into politics is the easy part. Getting out is the hard <laughs> part, right? Really? It's very difficult because you're pre-selected a year in advance. Then in well, in New South Wales and Victoria, you've got four-year terms, so you're basically locked in for that five years, unless you cause a by-election, which nobody wants to do. But I ultimately did that. But you know, you have to make sure that you've you know, got it all set up for the ne next person coming in. Mm. So um, that's, it's, it's a real challenge, choosing your moment to retire before either you get pushed out or voted out or you do something stupid and, you know, everybody hates you. So it, it's, it's a delicate balance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you don't want to be on any of those last three really. uh, on, on that list. <laughs> Too many people are, though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, hey, uh, Raf, the, the Victorian opposition leader, John Pazuto, that you touched on, uh, said in the news conference, it was something to the effect of the truth catches up with you. What does that mean? Well, it means he hopes that the integrity issues catch up right. with the Andrews government. Um, it, it is something we haven't spoken about. It's an incredible Achilles heel for this government. Mm. It took journalists and a Royal Commission in another state to work out what was going on. Terrible things that were going on in Crown Casino in this state. And there's a really significant issue for Dan Andrews when he derides the people who have investigated him, the corruption watchdogs as people who have... Well, no-one elected them. Uh, and he described Robert Redlich, who's one of the finest anti-corruption fighters this state has ever seen, and oversaw most mm. of the major investigations into Dan Andrews, and he derided him as yep. some, some guy who used to run an agency. I think that is a terrible flaw in Dan Andrews' character and his approach to government. It didn't catch up to him because he's such a consummate politician. I think John Pizzuto gets an entirely different response. When he comes onto our radio station, you can see from the text, he is a very plausible, very credible, very... Uh, he's a great vote-getter for middle Victoria, if I can, you know, steal from the middle Australia phrase. 
he's got to contain the pressures he's got in his own party. And I would also say that Jacinta Allen, from what I can tell, who would have been the Commonwealth Games Minister, she's almost certain to take over. She's nowhere near as consummate a politician as Dan Andrews. The contest between John Pizzuto and uh, Jacinta Allen is very, very different. I'm grateful to Toby for correcting me about the approval ratings. I don't place enormous store in them. The thing is, who are people going to vote for? But we've got three years. The debt issues are huge. We've got more debt than the other states combined in a few t uh, in a few years' time, more debt than New South Wales and Queensland combined. And those integrity issues will continue. Even if in Dan Andrews isn't there, they are off and running. And if John Pizzuto can just control the renegades and rogues in his own party, he has a huge chance of actually winning the election in three years' time. And just before I let you go, give us a sense of Jacinta Allen. You've mentioned uh, Ms Allen a couple of times and we've seen a tweet on X this afternoon saying oh, Jacinta will be throwing her hat in the ring to lead the party. Look, she's very, very good. She's very capable. Uh, the opposition, uh, she has a huge weakness because, of course, every infrastructure project you build uh, takes longer and costs more. Uh, that's a huge and significant factor that they can beat her about the head with, um, just politically, metaphorically speaking. She was the Minister for the Commonwealth Games. Airport Rail is not cancelled yet. It is on pause. The federal government haven't quite decided. <laughs> um, I think she would be seen as someone who's a competent administrator. <laughs> but her, her colleagues love her. They look up to her. She got into politics very, very young. She's got a regional seat up in Bendigo. So I think her colleagues um, feel very safe and secure with her. I think the opposition see a ton of opportunities. And I think the media in this state know they've got someone who is not... I mean, not, not many people are as good as Dan Andrews. Hopefully she will do many more radio interviews than Dan Andrews does. He does very, very few. He did, on, on your he did, show, perhaps? Yeah, One this year. <laughs> one. He did this year. One. You'll be getting your bids in uh, straight after that caucus vote tomorrow. Uh, my bids are already in. <laughs> my bids are already in. You've got rolling bids for all pollies. Uh, oh, I, the phone has been hot this afternoon. And as far as I can tell, by the way, I can't see anybody actually challenging Jacinta Allen. That could change, but I can't see anyone challenging Not her. Not Tim Pallas after those kind words that uh, Diane well, gave him. I don't think Tim Pallas is ever leadership material. Uh, God love Tim Pallas, but I don't think he ever saw himself as leadership material. But no, the contest is on. John Pizzuto knows if he can keep his party controlled, we are looking at a very, very different political situation in Victoria. Raf Epstein's the morning's presenter on ABC Melbourne. Thanks for your company. Great to have you on. Pleasure. Finally, and perhaps most pointedly for Victorians, has COVID-19 changed how frequently you engage with the arts? It's a question the federal government's rebranded Creative Australia Agency is looking at. Its latest research shows while attendance at arts events every few months is up from 18% in 2019 to 21% in 2022, regular weekly engagement at cultural events all round has declined from 5% to 3%. It's a shift in behaviour Live Performance Australia President Richard Evans attributes to the the post-COVID trifecta, rising touring and production costs, a decline in subscription and audience sensitivity to cost of living pressures as well. John, to start with, what does the arts mean to you, to your family? Oh, it's, a, it's, it's all the safe space. It's a recognition of like, well, for us, with our, with our culture, the notion of um, performance, live and living, still strong. So to be able to go and uh, either perform or watch our, our fellow Indigenous performances, it definitely creates a a really great, um, a great energy, and, and the notion of coming together as families. If we're going to go watch a particular uh, play, or um, I was mentioning the art, like the uh, Monet was up in Brisbane um, on a beautiful um, display, mm. visual one. Like it's, um, they're really important to expand the horizons and such. So, uh, really important, really essential. I love um, back on country. A shout out to Bias, but um, Jimbo uh, Opera on Burungam Country uh, has a beautiful um, opera under the stars, and, and, and that brings out our traditional dancers to perform and, and storytell as well. So it's a lovely mould between uh, the orchestra and um, traditional uh, music and sounds of country, which is a, a great reflection and uh, response around mm -hmm. um, modern, modern culture and also ancient rhythms that we have here. So really important, really important, Dan. Yeah, you've got all the bases covered there from the ancient right through to Monet. Uh, Katrina, I understand you went to the theatre recently, first time in a while. Has COVID changed you yeah, the way yeah. that you consume the arts? I, I hadn't even really thought about it, but I went and saw Tina, the musical Tina Turner. It was, it was fantastic. It was just so much fun. Laughed, cried, danced, sang. Um, but I haven't actually been to the theatre for years. It had been literally since pre-COVID. And 
I've read a book in the last couple of months as well, uh, Lessons in Chemistry, which was just a lot of fun. Um, I, I went to um, uh, Barbie the, the movie. Uh, you know, I've done a few things in the last couple of months that I, and I just hadn't done anything for years. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think it's great that people, you know, I think it's time that people start to look at their culture because it's so good for your soul mm. to do something like this. It's so enriching and, and good for your mental health to get out and do something. It's really positive, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Mitch, I'm told that you're a, a quote, metal head and that you've been around and gigging. <laughs> Tell me, what, what does the arts mean to you? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's the term. You don't need to put quotes on it. It's the long hair, it's the shirt. It's, yes, I, didn't want, to, so. I didn't want to make a judgment. <laughs> what are you saying about metalheads? No. So, I mean, my band have some gigs coming up. We're releasing some stuff soon. So if anyone wants to come see a death metal gig, Eye of the Enemy, check us out. Uh, free plug. But the for me, obviously, like I've been going to gigs since, you know, before I was legal drinking age. All ages gigs are a, are a huge part of the metal scene and, and all that sort of stuff. Um it's it's massive and it is unfortunate that it's again talking about dan andrews again um and the federal government failing to sort of put the money behind a cultural revival uh the arts revival that they did other sectors of you know the economy i don't even want to make an economic argument but there is um you know just a, a lack of sort of funding there from the governments and then a lack of support to people again through the the cost of living crisis so one thing that this might be my, you know, conspiracy theory mind that I get to sort of, you know, have my moment on. But one of the things that got me about this report was the number of people aged as 65 and over who read for pleasure has dropped from 77% to 68%. And people are reading less overall and people going out to gigs less. How much of this do we think might be our smartphones and social media just frying yeah. our brains, especially yeah. over the last yeah. few years, especially in some places that had lockdowns, where we've just sort of become much more addicted to these things which are designed to be addictive by billion dollar corporations. Absolutely. I find myself constantly enjoying books and yet I catch myself looking at my phone while yeah. the book is next to me we've, instead. We've become a bit, a, a bit addicted to it. Toby, I want to bring you in. We've got 30 seconds what? left at the, the arts. What do they mean to me? Yeah. Look, Interesting things, interesting people, great fun. You know, this weekend I'll be avoiding the grand final and probably going to Anna Schwartz to see a, an exhibition there. <laughs> you know, it would be terrific. <laughs> and why not? You know, and, and next week I'll be in Sydney briefly, so I'll be at White Rabbit and the MCA. Um, you know, those things fascinate and amuse. Um, films, you know, much lower brow. Uh, Barbie and Mission Impossible <laughs> were the last ones I saw, I'm ashamed to say. And I haven't seen any theatre for a while. <laughs> haven't, but, having uh, a go, a go either, either side there. <laughs> well, that is all that we've got time for. Thanks to our panel, Katrina Hodgkinson, Toby, Ralph, Mitch Alexander and John Davis. Frank Kelly is with you tomorrow night. Until next time, good night. <laughs>